high carb baking yeah. soda. Um, rumor has it and data has it that it can actually be a pretty effective training tool. Very effective. Could you explain a little bit of about how it works and how one might explore using sodium bicarb to enhance training output in a couple of different contexts? Yeah. So there's a handful of these ubiquitously effective supplements for performance. Sodium bicarbonate is one of them. And it's a very ingenious idea because it's so simple. Effectively, muscle contraction happens because enzymatic function occurs within a fairly specific pH range, right? So if it gets extremely acidic, it doesn't like it. And so whether you're running through aerobic glycolysis or anaerobic or anything else, all of these things require, even ATP hydrolysis requires ATPase. An enzyme has to do. Enzymes don't function well outside of this fairly special range. So what happens is generally fatigue the, the sensations of fatigue are actually caused by some signal that, hey, we're starting to run out of pH or we're getting in the wrong range. You're not out of gas usually. You're not too low on oxygen. You're not running low on muscle glycogen yet. You're typically going to see signs or feel signals of fatigue way prior to that, mostly being pH issues. That being said, what if we could regulate pH better? Enter bicarbonate, right? So um, without going too far into metabolism, Effectively, what happens is this. You take an inhale, and you're mostly breathing in oxygen, O2. When you exhale, you're breathing out CO2. So the difference is you've gained a carbon somehow. Well, all of your carbohydrates in your body come in the form of long carbon chains. In fact, that's what a carbohydrate means. It is a one carbon molecule that has one water molecule attached. It is a carbon that has been hydrated. In the case of like glucose, blood sugar, that's a six carbon molecule, right? In terms of fat, which are the only two places you're going to get most of your cellular energy, carbohydrates and fat, that is also a big, long block and chain of carbons. So whether you're getting your energy from fat or carbohydrate, you're going to split those atoms. So in other words, you've got six carbons attached to each other. And in this part of chemistry, it's exergonic. So when you break that carbon bond, so break one of those carbons off from the other, that's going to release energy. Just like if you had a pencil in here and I snapped it, you go bang and pop. I broke the bonds that were connecting that graphite to the next piece of graphite, and that released energy because I put energy into the system, etc. Okay. As a result, though, we've now had, you know, say five or six carbons chained together. We broke one off the end, which is not how it works, but making the point. And now you have one free-floating carbon. You use that energy release to then go make ATP, to then go make your muscles contract. But now you've got carbon floating around. You can associate free-floating carbon with being at a higher acidic level. It's not going to happen. The only way that you're going to go through this process is if your body says, do we have an oxygen molecule available that we can bind this to immediately? Yes, we do. That carbon attaches to that oxygen molecule. You can't just put CO2 in the blood because of what we just talked about. So you're going to bind it through this bicarbonate process. It's going to go through your blood. It's going to go into the lungs. It's going to go back into its carbon dioxide molecule. It's going to trans go through the alveoli into the lungs, and you're going to exhale. So you went from carbon to this bicarbonate system back into carbon, exhale. So inhaled O2 plants go the opposite, by the way. So they're going to breathe in the CO2. They're going to cleave off that carbon, stack those carbons together, and that's how they get larger. Um, in, your, in your blood, those six carbon chains are called glucose. If we store that in your muscle, we call it glycogen. So we take a bunch of glucose and stack it together. In a plant, we call that starch. That's effectively what it is, right? So you took a bunch of carbon from the atmosphere, stuck it all together, and that's a starch. Um, if you want to do it in the form of fruit, we take that starch like from the ground, you put it up through um, the tree, go all the way up to the top, put it into the flower, break it up into these big, huge chunks of starch into little forms called fructose or glucose. That's why fruit has fructose in it, and that's why tubers and stuff have starch in them. Basically, starch in an animal is glycogen in us. Okay, all that to say... If that's happening, and we know that a byproduct specifically of anaerobic glycolysis, meaning the breakdown of carbohydrates for fuel, typically in a very fast pace with low oxygen availability, the downside of that equation is acid production. We know that that's a problem because I, I started the conversation off there intentionally. So what if we could reduce the acid buildup? Now, you know how pH kind of works. I went and kind of double negatives there, right? You don't want too much acid buildup then could we prolong and sustain energy um, in a more effective pace, especially in this anaerobic 
um, interval kind of environment. And again, that's important because in those things, failure is not a result of running out of fuel or oxygen. It's a result of fatigue building up way too quickly. Is that also true for resistance training? Uh, There's maybe more of the, the creatine phosphate system. That can be an issue. It could simply be an issue of force production. You just don't have enough force. Produce. You're not out of energy. You just can't muster enough um, force. You do enough reps, then it's going to be an issue there. Uh, creatine phosphate would be the big winner, mm -hmm. depending. Um, so to come back a little bit to the beginning, and then I'll, I'm circling this all together intentionally. All right. Well, the way that we produce energy is going to be in two primary categories, anaerobic and aerobic. Aerobic meaning with oxygen, anaerobic meaning without. In terms of muscle contraction, you're pretty much talking about carbohydrates or fat. Now, fat is going to be exclusively aerobic, meaning I'm going to use fat from the entire body, roughly equally. So you're doing a sprint up a hill and your hamstrings or your glutes or your quads are on fire. You can't, you're not just going to use the fat that's directly in those hamstrings. You're going to lose it from the entire body. It has to go through lipolysis, so it's in this stored form in adipose tissue. It's got to get broken down, put into blood. Blood's going to have to go through your body, get taken up into muscle, taken up through muscle into the mitochondria. Then we're going to have to go through this process called beta oxidation. So remember, carbohydrates and glucose especially is a six-carbon molecule. Fat, if it's in the form of a triglyceride, it is a three-carbon glycerol backbone and three, you know, tri, one, two, three, fatty acids. Three carbon backbone, and those fatty acids are just big, long chains of carbon. That's all it is, right? So we're going to break that thing down, put it in the blood, move it up, move it into our mitochondria. You can't walk those things across the mitochondria wall. They're too big. So what you have to do is cleave them off into little chunks, and it turns out we break them off into two carbon chunks, so we call it beta, as in two. Move those into mitochondria. That can go through this little thing called Krebs cycle or triaxylic acid cycle, and you kick out a bunch of energy out of that. You had two carbons, so as a result of that process, you're going to generate two carbon dioxides. But remember, you can only go through that process if oxygen is available because you have to be able to place those carbons onto something or acid gets up way too high too fast. This is one of the reasons why fat is a nice fuel source, but it's very slow. It takes physical time to move from the back of your shoulder into your blood, down your hamstring, uptake, uptake, uptake. In addition, it's required oxygen availability. If you need energy faster, you simply don't have the time to bring in the oxygen, transport it through, go through capillaries, up, exchange through tissue, etc. Carbohydrate, on the other hand, is going to be stored locally in the exercising muscle cell, and specifically in the cytoplasm. As glycogen. As, gluc yeah, as glycogen in the storage there. So what's going to happen initially, your initial demands for exercise or for fuel are going to come from the glycogen stored within the muscle fiber itself. It's just going to break right there and you're going to be off the races. So you have the six carbon molecule, you're going to break it into two separate three carbon molecules. Okay, boom. That breaking provides you a tiny bit of energy. Very small, but some. Now you're going to take those two three carbon molecules and you want to be able to oxidize them because that's your only next step. But in order to do that, you got to go those into mitochondria. So you got to break one of those molecules off so then you'll be back to your two carbon molecule, just like you did with fat. That's going to go into mitochondria and then it's going to go through the exact same Krebs cycle, two carbons, et cetera. But hold on. If you don't have sufficient oxygen or sufficient mitochondrial availability and you're stuck at that two, three carbon place, what the do you do? You have problems, right? Now we have to say, okay, wait a minute. We have two, a three carbon molecule and we have a bunch of this acid buildup. Now, acid functionally is, is hydrogen. That, that's what pH, potential hydrogen is what pH stands for, right? So if hydrogen is building up as a byproduct of muscular contraction, and then you're having this three-carbon molecule, what it can actually do is grab one of those hydrogens. And those three-carbon molecules, by the way, are called pyruvate or pyruvic acid, right? If you take a pyruvic acid and you grab hydrogen, put it on top of it, we now have a different name for it. It's called? Hydrogen peroxide. Lactate. Bingo, right? That's what lactate or lactic acid is, right? So we've now built that up. So number one reason why lactate's not causing your fatigue, it's actually preventing it and that it does a bunch of other really cool stuff. But the point is that system can only last so, so long. That gets overwhelmed very quickly. What are you going to do with the rest of this hydrogen? Well, if you started off in a normal pH range, you, you don't have very far to go before you've now gone into that level of too much acidity. If you start off in a more basic 
and, and basically I don't mean simple, I mean chemistry, right? And more alkaline. Then that same amount of increase in pH is no longer, now it just puts you back in your physiological range. So sodium bicarbonate, whether taken as a cream or a powder or baking soda or anything else, can simply put you in a more alkaline state, even acutely. So this is something you can take right now before your, your workout. Um, you're going to delay what we call delay the progression of fatigue. And how would, how would people start to approach this practice? I, my understanding is you can do this with common, um, you know, store-bought baking soda. No question. Um, there's always a concern about gastric distress, oh, um, that it's a very effective laxative, um, sometimes an, an unwanted laxative effect. But how would one approach this before? Let's say I'm, I'm going to, I'm doing the mile repeats yep. exercise, uh, uh, mile repeats uh, protocol that we talked about earlier. I'm doing that for a few months and now I want to try the sodium bicarb yep. approach. I'm well hydrated. Hopefully I'm well rested. I'm ready to go. When am I going to drink this um, sodium bicarb solution? What? How would I make the solution? Uh, let's say I'm, I take ten ounces of water. Yeah. How much bicarb do I want? To, sodium bicarb should I put in there? Can we come up with it? Is it half a teaspoon? Is it a teaspoon? Um, here's how I'm going to tell you. You will thank me by starting lower. You can always go more later. So a little pinch. You cannot go backwards. How about I start with a quarter teaspoon? Fine. Half. Honestly, half is fine. Half a teaspoon. It's totally fine. Dissolve that. Slug yep. that down. Yep. I, I read a study recently that showed that people will hit their um, the the peak benefits of this at different times, but it's somewhere if I if memory serves me correctly, somewhere between sixty and ninety minutes later. So I might want to drink it on the way to the track. It, it can. It can be as low as twenty. Okay. So maybe um, as I get to the track, since I'm going to do some warm up with some walk and jogging, I, I say forty five minutes. Okay. That's a, just a very rough standard. But yeah, you're right. It is it is individualized, um, and you probably want to play with that a little bit. If not, just somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to an hour. Okay. And then um, the perceived and real fatigue, if done correctly, the perceived and real fatigue ought to be reduced. Yes. I can do more work without feeling exhausted. Will I feel less of a lactate burn? Yep. It, done in air quotes for those listening. I realize that's a very crude way to describe a complex yep. physiological process. Yep. Um, fantastic. Can sodium bicarb be used repeatedly for longer duration training. Yep. And if I were going to use it with um, weight training for whatever reason, maybe I'm doing circuit type training yep. or I'm doing the superset type strength training that you talked about before, push, pull, push, pull, where it's a little bit more cardiovascularly demanding. Yep. Um, then maybe I'd sip that throughout the workout, make sure there's a bathroom nearby, it <laughs> sounds like. Because I do, I am aware that um, many people get pretty serious gastric distress. It can happen very quickly. Okay. Great. Well, it sounds like an amazing training tool. Um, I really appreciate you sharing because I think it's, it's one that doesn't get a lot of airtime these days because it's been around, but um, sounds like it has some pretty impressive effects. Yeah, you, you know what's sort of funny about that is, I mean, I get it, pop culture is what it is, but still to this day, if you want to talk about sort of your most effective general health slash performance supplementation, it's the same three to four to five. And, Did, they're, and they're, it's because they work really well. 